chapter 16. You know, we have a lot of characteristics as humans today that we share with Jesus' disciples. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but it's true. We, we do. We have a lot of characteristics. And when we read some of the things that they thought and they did, um, sometimes we can be critical of them. But quite honestly, we, we have some of the same thought, thought patterns that go through our minds. And um, one of those, um, those I think we have in common with Jesus' disciples. Christians down through the ages have had, is that we can go on a kind of a pendulum swing between thoughts and terms that God is neither the Ebenezer Scrooge, as some people think, where, you know, God doesn't or he's angry with me because Or um, I'm not, you know, I basically, he, he's not, he, he's going to begrudgingly give me enough to get by, but that's about it. And I can't expect God to, uh, to help me in all that um, great of a degree. And there are a lot of Christians, I believe, that feel that way. And on the other side, there are Christians that go to the farther the extreme on the other side where they think that God is sort of like Santa Claus. And that is that God basically exists to give me what I want. Not that we would ever say it that way. But that's kind of how we think. And that is that, um, um, you know, if hopefully I have these plans for my life. And I'm kind of hoping that God's going to deliver. That he's going to give me what I want. And I think the disciples are going to struggle with that second idea that their will is hopefully what God's will is for their lives. And hopefully God is going to um, kind of come through for them. And I want you to think what's going to happen when these men hear Jesus say what he says in, in Matthew 16, our passage this morning, verses 13, especially verses 13 down through um, verse uh, 17, well, verse 19 really. When they hear Jesus actually tell them that he is the Messiah, that sets off a whole set of thoughts as it seems like they're getting exactly what they want. And yet it's not going to work out the way they were thinking. God has got a wonderful plan for each of their lives, but it is not a plan that they're thinking is going to happen. And it's not going to be an easy one either. And so that's why I've entitled the, the message this morning, God's will does not equal what you want. It really doesn't. It, he's got a better plan than what we think. And it's an eternal, meaningful plan. So before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I certainly can identify with the disciples. Many, many times we hear your word, even when it's preached or we read it. And then we take it and we kind of morph it into a package that appeals to me. Something that I want. And then I basically claim that you have told me you're going to give me what I want. And Father, uh, this happens over and over again as, as I, I know you see it um, regularly out of your children. And Lord, we are encouraged by the fact that when we see the disciples' flesh and blood responses uh, that this is not a surprise to you, but Lord, alert us to the fact that, that we don't call the shots, that your will is what is best, whether we, it appears that way in this life or not, it is what is best. And so I pray that you'll give us understanding of your word this morning, how it applies to each of our lives, and I pray that you'll guide us and direct us in our time together, and that you would accomplish in, in, in our lives what you want, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's notice this uh, first concept, and that, and that is uh, some goals. If you were following the Messiah, if you were actually one of the disciples, and, and by the way, there were a number of women that followed the, the, the Lord as well. If you're one of them and you hear that Jesus is the Messiah, now put yourself in the, in the 12 uh, uh, disciples' sandals for a moment. What would be your uh, goals once you find out that Jesus definitely is the Messiah, he's claimed it, that he is. 
What are your goals going to be? What do you think? What do you think, Keith? When is he going to take over his kingdom? Okay. So you're thinking, help Christ conquer the world. That's what Messiah is supposed to do. He's supposed to bring in worldwide peace. All right. Very good. You got number one. All right, what else would you? Yeah, Josh. Learn as much from him as you can. You want to learn as much from him as you can. That's a very good and spiritual answer, and I did not put that up there. That's very good, though. You do want to learn as much as you can. Good. Uh, I think along the same line, we're going to help usher in God's kingdom, which is going to be, there's going to be a government that's going to be set up. Okay? All right. And what else are you thinking, John? There's some uh, jockeying for position. <laughs> They're definitely going to jockey for position. You want to reign as a high official with him. You want to be up there in the government. And what John's point of they're struggling, they're going to struggle, unfortunately, for the rest of Christ's public ministry on this issue of who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Let me just show it to you. Okay, you're chapter 16. Go to chapter 18. Look at verse 1. At the same time, the disciples uh, came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's a discussion they're, they're having. Who's number one? Okay, go with me to chapter 20. And look at verse, uh, uh, let's see, what do we want? I think it's 20 and 21. Peter and John's mom gets involved in this, okay? Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children. That's Peter, uh, Peter uh, not Peter and John, that's James and John, excuse me. Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. I'd like you to make James and John number one and number two. By the way, how did the other guys take that? Skip down to verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Well, why are they so angry? Because they wanted the spot. That's why you're angry about it. Of course, Jesus didn't give them what they wanted there. Okay, Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 22. And we'll be right back to Matthew in a moment here. But Luke 22, this is, this is in the upper room, folks. This is the night Jesus is going to be betrayed. Okay, all that's going on with Judas leaving and all that. This is all happening. And look at verse 24. Is it first? Yeah, verse 24. There was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. This is something they would struggle with throughout the rest of Jesus' public ministry. So, God's will, it's, it's like it, they're thinking, when they think kingdom and Jesus being Messiah, they're thinking personal goals that they have for their own advancement. And let's be honest, that's our thought too. I, I, I want to serve the Lord and I want to get things from God. I mean, just honestly, that's how we think. So God's will can be exciting. It really can be. So let's notice back in chapter 16, verse 13, says, and when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, by the way, it's a, it's a northern... Um, uh, reaches it's it's really uh, it used to be kind of like the area of Dan up in that in that tribe so it's very very far north in, for the, for the nation of Israel and really it's in the Gentile hands now that's why it's called Caesarea Philippi uh, he asked his disciples saying whom do men say that I the Son of Man am so what we find is Jesus is actually going to ask two questions in this passage and the first one is who do people say that I am and they said some say thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias, that's Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, which is Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, what's interesting is when you hear these people, uh, Jesus, uh, the disciples are merely expressing the views of the common people of Jesus' day. These are the people that, that, that Jesus reminded them of. The first one's John the Baptist. Now, what do you know about John the Baptist? I'm sorry? He was the forerunner of Christ. <clears throat> what else do you know about John the Baptist? He was, his cousin. he was Jesus' cousin. Good. What else? Done. The last prophet of the Old Testament. 
He was the last Old Testament prophet, probably the greatest of them all. He came in the spirit of Elijah, so he was very fiery. He was very fiery. He came in the spirit of Elijah, you're correct. Very fiery. Matter of fact, John the Baptist is known for two different things. If you think about it, he, he called out the religious leaders who attended his baptism, and he called them a brood of snakes. Now think about the boldness of that. You see some religious leaders in your service, and you don't give them a Calkins pen and a welcome card. You call them a brood of snakes. Okay? What, what else do you remember about John the Baptist? He had words with somebody else, too. Joe. That's right. He called Herod out, told him he was wrong to have his brother's wife. And for that, he got beheaded. People, when they saw Jesus, they thought of John the Baptist. His fearlessness. Isn't that interesting? Fieriness. Who's the second guy that, they, that Jesus reminded them of? Elijah. Now, Elijah also was a fearless preacher. If you recall, he walked into Ahab's court, basically says, it's not going to rain until I say. That went on for three and a half years. Ahab was looking all over the place to find this prophet. Okay, he was the guy that, that prayed and fire came down from heaven. Um, he was also prophesied to come before the Messiah would, would arrive. But it's interesting that Elijah has the fire like John the Baptist does, but he also performed miracles. And so people, when they saw Jesus, they thought about Elijah. Who's the third guy? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. What was Jeremiah known for? Compassion. I heard somebody say it. Compassion. Compassion. Called the weeping prophet. He serves during a time when Israel was going down politically, morally, eventually militarily. He lived to see the destruction of the nation, carting off into slavery in Babylon. He saw the destruction of the temple itself. It's called the weeping prophet. And when Jesus was reminded some people of the compassion of Jeremiah, that gives you an idea, a little picture about Jesus' character. The fire of the John the Baptist, the, the power from God, obviously, with all the miracles that he did, like Elijah, and even more so. And then you got the compassion of a Jeremiah all wrapped up in one person. Who do men say that I am? But then he asked a second question. And what's that question? Verse 15. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Okay, fellas, you live with me. You walk with me. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you can almost think of, certainly Peter seems to often speak up for the group, but when Peter gives that kind of an answer, you almost think of the, the, the guys kind of standing there with kind of breathless, like, okay, what's going to happen right now? You know, what's Jesus going to say to this? And it's interesting, Jesus answered, verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So what's Jesus saying to Peter? You're right. Peter, it's not just you that figured that out. God showed you that. He's actually blessing Peter for coming up with that response. Verse 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a very controversial statement. I will tell you this, our Lord is making a pun, which I'm very grateful for. Puns are biblical. I'm very grateful for that. What is Jesus? He's, he's using the word Peter, which means a type of, it's a type of a rock. It's a large rock. But then when he says upon this rock, it's actually like a cliff. I'm going to build my church. And what he's saying, I, I, I believe, from this passage is certainly not saying that Peter is the rock because, because the, the, the genders do not match. And I know those of... Um, from the Roman Catholic theology, they would say, well, well, when Jesus speaks this, it's in Aramaic, and so there is no difference between the, 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 the genders. The, the problem with that is, as the Holy Spirit will record it in the Scripture, it's clearly not referring to Peter. 
So you have to take the scripture out of it to, to make that argument. What the scripture records is that Jesus is using a pun, but he is saying there is something else he's going to build the church upon. And what I believe he's talking about is the confession that Peter just made, the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the foundation stone of the church. That if you don't agree with that, you don't have salvation. So Peter is, is, has made the, the, really the, the, the statement that the church will be built on. Which, by the way, also shows something else. Some people think that the church has been down through the Old Testament into the New I want you to look at what he says here. Upon this rock, I will build my church. It's future. The church has not started yet. It's not something that was in the Old Testament. When you, when you uh, adopt the philosophy or the, the, the theology that the church was in the Old Testament, there are some serious dangers with that. For instance, when Elijah the prophet calls out the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, what did they do with those false prophets? They killed them. Which is why when you see in England's history, okay, there were Bible believers that would put to death people of other faiths because they thought the church was in the Old Testament. It's not. We don't handle things that way today. We're not supposed to. It's a different entity. But because of a misunderstanding, there are serious consequences in this. The church is not in the Old Testament. The church is going to be built. It's going to be built in the New Testament. And it's not a building, it's an organism. It is composed of the believers in Jesus Christ and that critical statement that he is the Son of God. He's the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Son of God. But also notice that Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. We'll have to think about what this means for just a moment. Verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that interesting? That's why sometimes you see the, 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 with the pictures or whatever of Peter standing at the gate of heaven. It's, it's really not what, that, what, what Jesus is talking about here. But he says, And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now Peter is given the keys to the kingdom. What does that involve? Well, first of all, the authority to, to declare something was, is forgiven or not forgiven is where is the reason why in Roman Catholicism they believe the, the, um, the Pope and then the priests underneath him have the right to forgive sins. That's why people go to them for forgiveness of sins. But let me just show you that that really isn't something that is invested in, in any man. I'll just take you to one passage. It's in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 2. I want to flip over there real quick. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look with me at verse 5 and 6. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. What does it say? It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, what does it mean to be a mediator? A go-between. You go between two parties. Who goes between God and men? And that is the man Christ Jesus, the God-man. It is not any of us. Who gave himself, verse 6 says, a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus Christ is the mediator. I then pray in Jesus' name and come before God in Jesus' name. I do not come before another human being to get forgiveness of sins. Now, what, what is Jesus talking about there? What does he mean when he says, I, I believe what he's talking about is that, that Peter is going to have authority before God as, by the way, the other disciples and the church itself would have to line up and, and, and express openly what God's will is towards something. Matter of fact, um, if you notice when he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, actually how the, the original language will read that is, it, is the idea of it's already been bound in heaven. You are basically declaring what God has already done. Let me show you one example of this. Go, go in my Bible, it's just like a page over. Go to Matthew chapter 18. And look with me starting at verse 15. Matthew 18, starting with verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now notice verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That's the exact same wording. 
In the context of church discipline, what, what, what the Lord is saying is what, whatever you are saying is bound on earth has already happened in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When you're declaring as a church body in the context of church discipline, this brother or sister has repented, God has forgiven, that's exactly what's already happened. It's the same wording that was given to Peter. You'll also find something very similar given to all the disciples in John chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. So what is Jesus talking about? In what way does Peter have the keys to the kingdom? Peter would open the door of the gospel on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, um, the day of Pentecost to a largely Jewish audience in, in Acts chapter 2. If you recall, when, when uh, the Holy Spirit comes and it's on the day of Pentecost and, and there's, a huge, there's a number of people already in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate that feast and it's obvious that something unusual is going on because the disciples are speaking not in gibberish but in literal languages that people can understand. And they're saying, what does this mean? Because these guys are Galileans, it's obvious, and yet they're speaking in our dialect what is going on. Who stands up? Peter. And says, this is what's going on. The Holy Spirit has come. Jesus Christ has died on the cross. He's, he's risen from the dead. He is the Messiah. You need to turn to him. He opened the door of the kingdom to the Jewish people. But in Acts chapter 10, you find there's a Gentile man. His name is Cornelius. And Cornelius wants to be saved. He's been seeking the Lord, and God sends an angel. He says, I want you to go down to a city called Joppa. There's a guy staying there right now. His name is Peter. Bring Peter up here. He'll tell you what to do. And Peter, as he comes up there, expresses the gospel of the, of the salvation through Christ. And while he's still speaking, they come to know the Lord. They put their faith in Christ, and the door is now officially open to the Gentiles. Peter then would open the door of the gospel to the Jewish world and to the Gentile world as well. And I think that is part of the blessing that Jesus is giving to this man here for his statement that the church will be built on, and that is you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. God's will can be very exciting. You had two questions. Then you got these three predictions that Jesus makes. And the, uh, and the three predictions, I'll just list them off for time's sake is that he would build his church on the rock of Peter's statement, number one. He's going to build his church on that rock. Peter's statement, he's the Christ. Number two, that Satan's best efforts would not stop the church from advancing. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Think of it, the, the picture is of Satan trying to wall around areas of the world and to keep people from embracing the Savior. And what Jesus is saying is, my children are going to go th over those walls, under those walls, around those walls. They're breaking down those walls. They're not going to be successful in holding the Word of God from the peoples of the world. And we've seen this down through the ages. Where places that were strongholds of evil have fallen, thank God, spiritually, and the gospel has gone forward. Think of one particular guy in a, in a part of India that was in great darkness. And how a, a one guy called to go there back around the turn of the, the last century in the, in the 18 to the 1900s, early 1900s, I believe. Goes over to a group of people that were headhunters, they were cannibals. They, he, he shares the gospel with them. And, and as a result of his just a few months being there, people are converted and, and, and the gospel goes forward until almost that entire tribe is reached for the Lord. That's what Jesus is talking about. The gates of hell, as strong as Satan can make his strongholds, they cannot prevail. Can I just encourage you on something? Some of you know loved ones, and you feel very much like the fact that there is a huge wall around that person. And they've got their offenses. They've got their excuses as to why they will not turn to Christ. Keep praying. Seeking God. I'm not saying that every one of them will come to Christ, but I am saying this, that over and over and over again, God shows this truth to be true. And that is the gates of hell cannot prevail against the gospel going forward. Satan's best efforts will not stop God's church from advancing. Prediction number three is that Peter would be given those keys to the kingdom. And he would open the door, which he exactly which he did, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. 
open the gospel to the to the Jewish world and to the Gentile world. Now, God's will is not only exciting, and certainly this was an exciting moment for these men, but it can be confusing. Because the very next thing that Jesus says here doesn't seem to make sense. You're in Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse 20. Then he charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Can you imagine? If you're going to build your army, Keith was talking about that, right? You're going to take over the world. If you're going to build your army, you're going to, then, then you've got to start talking to people. You've got to start letting people know who he is. And what Jesus is saying is, nope, fellas, I don't want you telling anybody. So what we have here is we have a confusing command. Now, there's other things in between here, okay? I'm going to handle them under a different point. Skip down to verse 28. Jesus says this, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now again, put yourself in their sandals and you hear that. What are you thinking? Let me read it to you again. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What do you think, Keith? Sounds like the kingdom is really, really close if it's not here. But he, notice he uses the word some. What does that indicate? Maybe not all. Sounds like that um, maybe the kingdom's not going to happen immediately because he's saying there's a, at least some of you that are going to live to see this thing with me so it's like maybe the kingdom is isn't going to be as quick as we were thinking and also maybe some of us are going to die before it happens maybe most of us we don't know he said some by the way he's actually talking about the transfiguration but we have this confusing prophecy how does that fit because every one of them dies before actually seeing the physical kingdom being a part of it. They all, the, John, James, and Peter in the next chapter saw the transfiguration, which seems to be the answer to this prophecy. But I'm just telling you this, that's confusing. It's confusing. And I don't know about you, but there are many times when you go through life and you think God's leading you this way, and all of a sudden it's like a completely different direction. It's like, I didn't think God was going to do that. God's will is exciting at times. But it can also be confusing. There are some times when God gives a command that doesn't seem to make sense. There are times when, when you think God's leading in a direction and it doesn't go the way you're expecting that direction to go. I'll tell you a third thing about God's will. God's will can be agonizing. It's a painting of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. A lot of the paintings that you'd find of the Garden of Gethsemane present the Lord in, in kind of a, a, like a, a beautiful, a serene prayer position. Folks, I, I don't think it was anything like that. You remember, he is sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. So I want you to notice what he says next. Again, these disciples have just heard he is the Messiah. Now they've just been told, don't tell anybody. Look at verse 21. From that time forth, and I've circled those words right there. From that time forth, after Jesus has explained to them who he is, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That would be the disciples' worst nightmare. This is what you would call a strange prophecy. If you are the Messiah and you're the Savior and you're supposed to reign, then how is it that you're going to suffer in Jerusalem at the hands of the religious leaders. That would make sense because of, they knew the, the jealousy there. But you're going to die at the hand of your enemies. And then you're going to rise from the dead three days later. How is that going to work? So I want you to notice Peter's foolish rebuke, verse 22. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. By the way, one of the other gospels says, says when it says he took him, he, he took him aside. It's almost like he got his arm around the Lord and said, here, come over here for a second. Let's just talk you and I. And then he begins to rebuke him. 
And he's saying, far be it from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Lord, you're not going to die. You're the Messiah. You're going to reign. Peter's rebuke of Jesus is short-sighted. He does not see the eternal necessity of the cross. He doesn't see that he can't go to heaven and you and I can't go to heaven if Jesus doesn't die for our sins. He doesn't see that. It's short-sighted. It's also self-centered. Why do I say it's self-centered? Was that Joe? He does think he knows better than Jesus. That's exactly right. And if Jesus doesn't reign, neither does Peter. He wants Jesus to reign. For his own sake. You see, so many times we interpret God's will in our what I want. And Jesus points this out. Notice our Lord's stern response to this. Verse 23. But he turned and said to, unto Peter. By the way, the other Gospels point out, he says this to all of them, okay? Uh, but it's, it's directed to Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou art an offense unto me. Wow. He's saying to Peter... That your rebuke of God's plan is like Satan. Satan is a, not that, by the way, Satan is not trying to keep Jesus off the cross. Don't think that. Satan doesn't see the cross. But what Jesus is pointing out is that Satan is in rebellion against God's will, and that's exactly what Peter's doing. If Jesus is truly the Son of God, and Jesus is telling them that it's God's will for him to go to the cross, then, then, then Peter is like Satan and thinking, I got a better plan. His thought process and reasoning are an offense to the Lord himself. And why are they there? Notice he says, you are, you are an offense unto me, for thou savest. You desire not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Peter, it's based upon your own human desires. Instead of realizing that God's will is far higher and more important than your will, or the will of anyone else, for that matter. Peter was assuming that his will was the same or even wiser than God's will. If Jesus is the Messiah, then Jesus is going to reign, and I sure hope that God lets me reign with him. And then our Lord gives some important lessons to his disciples at this point. There are two of them found in this passage. There's another one found in another gospel uh, account of this same incident. What are the lessons that Jesus gives, it, gives for us here? Verse 24, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Lesson number one, following Christ demands death to yourself. It's no longer your life. Say, God really messed up my life. No, no, no. If, you, if you're a Christian... He didn't mess up your life. It was his life all along. Do we really believe that? Now think about it. Do you believe that? Because it changes the way you look at things. Is it his life or your life? Jesus is saying, fellas, you have to take up a cross. And remember, you don't survive the cross. Death to self. Principle number two, verse 25. For whosoever shall will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? One of the other gospels add that when you lose your life for my sake and the gospels, to save your life then, lesson number two, you must lose it for Christ and the gospel. If other people who do not know Christ or those who are not in tune with Christ are somehow thinking you're wasting your life, you're probably on the right track. Jesus is saying, you have to die to yourself. It's no longer your life when you follow me. It's mine. Number two, you save your life. If you want to hang on to it for yourself, you're going to blow it. 
Principle number three is found in, God, in, in Mark chapter 8, verse 38, where it simply says this, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So principle number three is Christ's followers should be unashamed of him and his words. And I will tell you that it's increasingly being slandered in our culture today. May God help us not to be ashamed of what our Lord has said in his, in his book. It's all his. And may we not back down from what he said. May we not be ashamed of what he said. May we not try to explain away what he said. One of those issues that today is, is, co is commonly mocked in the unsaved uh, society is the issue of an eternal hell. And may I say that Christ talked about it repeatedly. As a matter of fact, about half of our doctrine in, in the issue of hell comes from the lips, lips of Christ himself, if not more than half. And if people want to say, well, I don't believe a good God would send anybody to hell, you're taking on Christ himself. And like Peter, you're thinking you know more than he does. Let's not be ashamed of what he said. Uh, certainly our Lord begged people. He, weep, he wept over people. And we ought to have compassion. But we cannot back off this doctrine because it's so important. People need to understand that it's not merely I'll figure it out one day. That there is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun. It's a reality. And we're not helping people by denying this doctrine. Don't be ashamed of him. Don't be ashamed of his words. Jesus said one more thing to us, and that is God's will is worth it. Look at verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. You know what he's saying by that? He's saying, my kingdom is going to come. I'm coming back. It's not like you think it is, fellas, but I am going to return. He's saying, my, uh, I am going to reign. That's why he's going to reward people. You can't reward them if you're not in control. I'm going to reign. And I am going to reward. I'll reward every man according to his works. And so our Lord is saying, hang on, fellas. It's not going to be what you think. It's not going to be what you think. God's will is not equal your will. But I will tell you that, that on the other side of eternity, these men were, were, were so thankful that they had followed the Lord. So we come to conclusions about God's will. You think of the two paths in the woods. Actually, I'd almost have three because sometimes, um, uh, again, there's a, there's a totally different direction than what we're thinking. But let's, let's just let's consider about God's will. First of all, it can be exciting and rewarding. There's no doubt about that. And, and, and many of us could give testimony of how, what a blessing it is to follow the Lord. It is. It's a privilege, and there are many joyous times. I know that God has given me personally, and I'm, I'm sure that many of you would say the same thing. But let's be honest. Isn't God's will confusing at times, too? You're looking for direction, and you don't know. And God isn't answering. There are times it is confusing. It is. These fellows are going through that. They're going to go through that really until after the cross, after the resurrection, they're going to go through this. And I'm sure there's other times in their lives beyond that. But they're going to go through some major times of confusion. God's will can at times be the exact opposite of what you would choose. We listed a couple of people that just lost their loved ones. I don't think any of them would have said, that's my choice for this week. I want to lose my loved one. I don't think so. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross, folks. Listen to his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's sweating drops of blood thinking about it, praying about it. I wish I could say that, boy, you're going to get everything you want from serving God. But to be honest with you, then would you really love him or would you be making a deal with God? By the way, that was Satan's accusation of Job, if you look at it. A lot of times he's right. 
That's why preaching and acting like God should just give you what you want is a popular thing. It just doesn't work. Number four, God's will is about his wise eternal purposes, not our self-centered temporary ones. Peter wants to reign, and he wants to reign now. And I get that. I would have felt the same way if I was in his sandals. I would have. But that wasn't God's plan. And God's plan was better. If, if, if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, none of us go to heaven. Number five, his, eternal, his, his will is about his eternal purposes and his meaning. That's what it's about. About what God wants. Because God understands. And when he tells us, my thoughts are, are not your thoughts, your ways are not my ways, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. He means it. He means it. It's true. By way of application, let me give you three. You, got, you can choose... First of all, to abandon God's will for your will. A lot of people do that. That was Judas. When Judas is somewhere along the line, becomes convinced that Jesus really isn't going to reign. He's not going to give him what he wants. Judas abandons ship for his will. And a lot of people do that. That is when, when I know what my want, what I want is not what God wants, that I'm abandoning God and I'm doing what I want. There's option number two, trying to force God's will into your will. Disciples are there. Lord, you're going to reign. You're not going to die. I'm going to stick with you. But we're just not going to let that happen. You ever tried to do that? You read the scripture and you read your, your desires into the scripture? Yeah, we can all do that. Try to force God's will into your will. Really, option number three is what we want, and that is submitting to God's will and dying to yours. That's not easy. It isn't, folks. It isn't. But I'll tell you on, from, from, the, from heaven's perspective, when God sees his children and they make choices, simply, and it's in, sometimes in agonizing circumstances, and sometimes it's, it's, it doesn't feel good, it doesn't, it's, it's absolutely, the, again, where they would not want to be if they had any choice in the matter. But they choose to walk with God through the valley. I'm telling you that is such a precious thing to, the, to, to God above. When he sees his children submitting to his will and saying, Lord, whatever you want, it's okay. And meaning it. Meaning it. Can I ask you some? I've told this before, but I think it's kind of interesting. There's a famous preacher, and I think his name was F.B. Meyer. Some of you may have heard of him. But he had a, a dream that was, he really felt was like from the Lord. He's sitting in his office in his dream, and um, the Lord came into his office, and he could tell that the Lord was, Christ was a little bit upset with him. And so he said something to the Lord. I don't remember exactly what he said, but like, you know, what's wrong? You know, I've, I've given you everything in my life. And Jesus said, well, if you've given everything in your life, he said, can I have that? And he pointed to his hands and he said in my dream I immediately clutched my hand together just like that and Jesus basically said if you're going to serve me I'm going to have to have that and F.B. Myers hanging on to that and, and he said in my dream he said I could not let it go I could not let it go And finally, he said to the Lord, this is what he said. He said, um, he said, I cannot let this go. He said, I am willing, however, for you to take it from me. You can take it from my hand. I wonder, I 
what that thing would be that, that honestly, if God put his hand on that, you say, Lord, you can't take that in your life, in mine. And I don't know how it's going to play out, folks. I don't know how God's will going to play out for any of us. I can just say this, that what Jesus is calling for is abandonment of your will for his. It's not, God, I hope you, I hope you agree with what I want. It's the idea that your will has to be my will. That's the way it is. I'm dying to myself. Because the bottom line is this, you can't live for self and God at the same time. You just can't. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You can't. Matthew 6, 24. You can't. God's will can be confusing, absolutely. It can be exciting at times, absolutely. It can be exactly opposite of what you would choose. But he's got eternal purposes with eternal meaning back behind them. And we need to submit to his will no matter what. Father, help us. Lord, this is not something that the disciples were going to have as an easy lesson. This was something that they were going to battle with and struggle with. And it wouldn't just even end at the cross. I, I'm sure that as they go through life, this is something they're going to deal with. And there's all kinds of decisions like that. There are times, Lord, when you take something very precious from us. It could be a loved one. It could be health. It could be a great opportunity. It could be finances. It could be our reputation. Lord, there's all kinds of things that you can take. And the reality is that when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, which is what he's supposed to be, when we take you as our king, Father, you have a right to it all. You have a right to every bit of it. Forgive us, Father, for many times we want to abandon your will for our own. Forgive us for trying to cram your will into our desires. And to read your word as if you're giving, me, you're giving me evidence or to hear a speaker and he confirms something. And Lord, the reality is sometimes it, that may be real. There are other times we're just lying to ourselves because we want what we want. Oh Lord, give us the attitude of our Savior who up against the... The cross in the Garden of Gethsemane says, Not my will, but thine be done. Oh, Lord, help us. And I pray for Christians who are suffering because you've taken something from them. Or they mean to make a tough decision. Lord, help them. Help us. To realize it's your life when we come to Christ. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And we're called to glorify you in our body and in our spirit, our attitudes. Help us to do it, Lord. You are worthy of all the best that we can give thee. May we believe that in our heart of hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. With our heads bowed for just a moment. Maybe you're here and you're not a believer yet. You say, boy, Pastor, you just laid out a case for coming to Christ saying that basically he owns everything I've got. Yeah, he does. <laughs> you're going to either acknowledge that now or you're going to acknowledge that on the other side of eternity when it's too late. And I would beg you, if you're not saved, to understand there is a real heaven and there is a real hell. And God doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants you with him. Jesus died so you could be forgiven. If you're here and without Christ, we'd be glad to help you. Simple repentance and faith. It's, it's being willing to turn from running my own life to, to, to let Christ have, have, have me. And to turn to him for salvation. Some of you may have made a, prayed a prayer, but honestly, you were thinking that, that you were kind of signing up just for heaven, not realizing that, no, I, when, when I come to Christ, I, I'm giving him my life. That's real salvation. If you're here and you're without Christ, you'd like to talk to someone. Anyone like that? Just raise your hand if you would. I'll make sure I try to get around and help you. Anyone like that? I'll, I'll, make, I'll definitely be happy to make the time talk with you personally.
Anyone like that? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, but you find me or find a friend of yours that knows the Lord and talk to him. Secondly, Christian, are, are you willing to, to follow Christ what his will is? Even when it's confusing? Even if he asks you to do something that's agonizing? Are you going to be angry with God when he takes something from you? Or do you recognize, really, it all belongs to him anyway? May God help us. Because this is a key to living a Christian life. To realizing, I am not my own. It is not my life. It's his. May God help every one of us to truly believe that. And so let's close in prayer and asking God to help us on that regard. Oh, Lord, give us your grace to, to really believe in our depth of our being that it's true. That when you bought us with the blood of, of, of Jesus, Father, we are privileged to be yours. We're privileged when things are going well, and we are privileged when they're going in the exact opposite direction of what we'd want. We are privileged, Lord, when we're able to make a good and, and, and wonderful decisions, and that we're privileged, Lord, when we have to make the tough ones. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us to realize... My life is not my own. And may we have lives, we're not asking, Lord, that they be always easy. We do ask that they would be meaningful, that you would accomplish through our lives what you want and glorify your name, we pray. May we think on these things and live them out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you are dismissed.